You're welcome back. We're glad to know that you're still there. And uh, this is the breakfast show on Plus TV Africa, in case you're just joining us. And we did promise you that we're going to do a little bit uh, about health this morning, even though every Thursday we talk business mostly. But today uh, they say health is wealth. And so we're going to be concentrating on that aspect of your wealth, which is health. And our area of concern today is that the U.S.-based cardiology professors are helping Nigerian cardiologists and patients to bridge the gap. What that means is what you're going to get right now and how it's going to help us and what the program stands uh, for. Uh, everything we need to know we're going to talk about on the show this morning. We have uh, uh, to my far, far right, right, left rather, okay, I've forgotten my hands, <laughs> my far left, Dr. Sheyi uh, Bolorun Duro, interventional cardiologist, Nova Cardiovascular Care, I know her, I'm sure, Heart and Vascular Institute, Virginia, in the USA. Good morning and welcome to the program. Thank you very much. And we also have Dr. Obinaya Emerole, interventional cardiologist as well, and President, Cardiovascular Education Foundation, Chairman, Cardiology Division, Atrium Health, Navicent, Georgia. I hope I got that right. Good yes, morning and welcome uh, to the program. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks for having us. Yeah. When we hear cardio, we're thinking our hearts, we're thinking about people who slum, we're thinking about some dangerous things and all that. Before we go into the program that you're doing, you're having with our um, cardiologists in Nigeria and all that, let's try to have an insight into what cardiovascular health is uh, in the first place. Where do I start from? Let me start. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I wish our away. democracy were like this. You know, take the other guy and not let winner take all. Okay, let me begin with you. Dr. Um, yeah, heart disease is um, one of the leading causes of death uh, all over the country. Mm. Um, you know, the, the most important uh, risk factors for heart disease include uh, high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, uh, high cholesterol, cigarette smoking, uh, being overweight, uh, lack of exercise, um, and, and also uh, heredity, you know, some, some of the genes that we have. Um, the, the most common uh, symptoms are uh, shortness of breath, uh, you know, getting tired easily, uh, chest pain, uh, chest discomfort, uh, swelling of the legs, uh, leg edema, and sometimes uh, passing out or blackout spells, and for a few unfortunate people, uh, sudden cardiac death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what we try to do is to uh, educate uh, everyone, educate people to be aware of the, the symptoms so that they can uh, seek uh, medical attention early. Um, in general, we would encourage a heart-healthy lifestyle, which includes um, avoiding cigarette smoking, uh, exercising regularly, eating a diet that is uh, healthy, fruits, whole grains, vegetables, uh, maintaining a, a healthy weight, uh, keeping an eye on your blood pressure. Normal blood pressure is 120 over 80, so avoiding hypertension, keeping an eye on your blood sugar, uh, getting adequate treatment if you have um, diabetes, uh, um, keeping an eye on the cholesterol, ensuring that you don't have uh, high cholesterol. Um, and then if you do notice any symptoms, uh, chest pain, getting short of breath easily, um, having fluttering of the heart, uh, palpitations, developing leg swelling, developing the uh, dizzy spells or blackout spells to, to seek medical attention early, um, see your uh, family physician or primary care provider. Uh, sometimes they will, you know, do a history and physical examination. They may want to do uh, an EKG, an electrocardiogram, which is a recording of the electrical activity of the heart. And then depending on what they find, you may be 
Uh, you may need to be further evaluated by uh, a heart disease specialist, a, mm. a cardiologist. And, and oh, well, it sounds like we need to go back to school <laughs> to, to find out. Because when you were reeling out the things that we need to do, you know, uh, exercise, you have to eat uh, healthy, you have to do that. And I was like, how many of us even know that? You know, you talked about also visiting a, a family physician. Those are very un-Nigerian kind of things, you know. How many families have physicians that uh, take care of them? How many people even want to go to the hospital in the first place and all that? And she, he mentioned exercises. An average Lagosian will say, are we not having enough exercise by just trekking and by just jumping buses and all that? How, how deliberate should we be about, for instance, the exercise uh, part of it? So I think the concept of exercise is very, very underestimated. And it's the biggest thing that you could do in terms of making yourself live longer and have a better quality of life. Mm. Now, we're cardiologists. We're focusing on heart-healthy lifestyle. But the heart is not just isolated. It's not just, oh, my heart is good, means that my brain can be bad. Or so it actually affects the whole body. Okay. So what we're talking about reduces the risk of impact on your heart, the brain, the kidneys, the lifestyle, your quality of life, your knees. Eventually, if you get obese, messes up your knees, your quality of life long term. So that impact of exercise is underestimated. And that's what I want to emphasize from your question. So the American College of Cardiology recommends 150 minutes of 30 minutes, uh, 150 minutes of exercise a week of moderate intensity exercise. So moderate intensity means getting your heart rate up, means you know you actually getting up and actually taking a walk, at least 30 minutes, you know, walk or something, like that, and then increasing it. So yes, we do go through stress. Yes, we do try to um, you know get out of our houses take the bus, take the train and everything like that to get to work and all of that or whatever it is that, you, that involves getting to work or going about your normal activities, but being intentional about it. So waking up early and um, taking an extra walk or run or do something or, you know, do some exercises, press-ups, pull-ups, whatever it is, but just being intentional about that 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise, not, which is different from what you're doing chasing the kids mm. or, <laughs> or doing out the regular stress that we deal yeah. with every day. Oh, okay, yeah. you've heard that. <laughs> exercise <laughs> have to be deliberate about it. Yes. Okay, now, um, you're working with cardiologists in Nigeria and all that, but before we go into what you're doing with them, let's, let's get to know, you say you have a foundation and yes. some other things. Give us a, a brief history about this foundation and how um, you got to connect with the Nigerian cardiologists before you started doing what you're doing now. Okay. The, the name of the foundation is uh, Cardiovascular Education Foundation. Mm. And um, basically our objective is to uh, advance cardiovascular education, training, patient care, and research in sub-Saharan Africa. So about uh, 10 years ago, a, a group of us, you know, got together and looked at um, the challenges that, that really we are facing uh, sub-Saharan Africa in general, but Nigeria in particular, just because that's where most of us come from. And we noticed there was an um, increase in the burden of uh, non-communicable diseases, especially cardiovascular disease. Uh, but at the same time, the, the one, there wasn't enough uh, specialists in the field of um, cardiovascular care. And um, some of the few that we had, that we had in the country, we are, we are immigrating. And um, we decided to see how we could help um, you know, build up capacity in the country to, to help with the training of um, the specialists in, in the field that will take care of the patients. Um, we also looked at the, the training that was being given, the education, to identify where there were gaps that we could work with the, the people training the doctors here to, to bridge the gaps. Mm -hmm. 
So, so we came together and uh, formed a, a non-profit uh, called Cardiovascular Education Foundation that's registered both in the U.S. and here. And, and we partnered with uh, the Nigerian Cardiac Society. Um, we also developed collaborations with uh, some of the local teaching hospitals. And, and what we do in, in, in terms of programming, we have uh, virtual didactic lectures over Zoom. And then we've established relationships where we discuss uh, patients that, that you know, um, they have difficulties with and we'll see if we can come up with solutions. And then we have our hands-on uh, training missions uh, where we rotate people, they come, they work uh, with the physicians here. Um, especially in some of the uh, more uh, advanced uh, subspecialties within cardiology, um, where we have uh, cardiac catheterization laboratories uh, for, for people who need cardiac catheterization which is a procedure where a small tube is inserted through one of the arteries to the heart, and we take x-ray pictures to see if they have uh, blockages that are causing chest pain or causing a heart attack, and we can open up those blockages by the insertion of, of stents. So we've, we've been involved in uh, training uh, some of our local physicians to to uh, provide these services so that, you know, um, people who have a heart attack here can get, you know, world-class care. And um, our goal essentially is to uh, train the manpower within the country and bring uh, the standard of cardiovascular care in the country to what would be expected anywhere in the world. Um, of course, there are resource limitations and we have to work with our local collaborators to develop what we would consider best practices for, for the limited resources that we have in our environment. Yeah. Uh, it's funny that he ended with limited resources because uh, uh, I was thinking about a, a wider scope. Because when, when you train the cardiologists in Nigeria, the training of the people is one thing. Uh, getting the people to even access what, they, what kind of knowledge you are imparting on them is another thing. I don't know your level of interaction, Che, you know, uh, with the people, the patients or would-be patients or the society that needs to get information about this cardiovascular health. Is there any form of interaction or is there anything in the offing that you want to begin to do to bring uh, it to the conscience of the people? Thank you very much. That's a great point and that's exactly why we're here. Um, we want to focus on, so we're interventional cardiologists, we train and practice in the U.S., but just giving some background, I went to medical school here in Nigeria, in the University of Eloring. He also trained in Nigeria also. So we understand our unique uh, limitations in Nigeria. And so given those unique uni limitations in Nigeria, um, the goal is to ensure that we not only affect the physicians, we want to make it um, three-faced. We want to affect the physicians, we want to affect the patients individually, and then we want to affect the community. Yeah. Because it's multifaceted. So what happens in an environment that succeeds in getting, reducing life, um, you know, reducing uh, mortality from cardiovascular disease is you build a systemic structure that actually helps this get better. So when my family member, you know, has chest pain, you know, they should know that, okay, look, it's not, uh, oh, you lie down and take time and Panadol, but actually, okay, well, this is something concerning. Do we need to communicate at that point to, to get you to the hospital? And then what kind of hospital do we want to get you to? You know, when my family member tells me, oh, look, one side of my face is getting, getting weak, or I can't speak, or I can't hear them very well, like, is that a stroke? And then, and that's not going to come directly from just training the physicians. We're training the community, and that's why we're here. Yeah. We want to make sure the community understands what those risk factors are. We've talked about treatment. We've talked about what we're doing in terms of training to be able to get a stent, a coronary stent, 
to be able to get a pacemaker if you need a pacemaker, to be able to get a defibrillator if you need a defibrillator, which is what we're developing in the local institutions in the hospital in the country. We've gone to quite a few institutions in the country developing that system and not just doing these things for patients and then the patients leave, but actually training the people on ground to do it. Because we want to like not just give you fish, but teach you to fish. Mm -hmm. So create a system where this hospitals can work independently and then also we bring resources from the US and then, and, and then you know we have um, partners we bring stuff and then, you know to donate them to these sites um, but the idea is speaking to the public speaking to everybody right now is like when you we want to know these risk factors we want to know okay what happens when you when somebody has chest pain when your family member is having palpitations or loses consciousness um, you know, what are the things to look out for and then where do you take them to? And when you take them there, you know, what would happen? And that's that um, pathway, that's that process we want to try to implement. And then just making sure that everyone is aware and then just being more heart healthy. Someone passes out in front of you, it's not the time to fan the person and say, oh yeah, let's pour water on him, let's fan him. You know, yes, we want to figure out why he's passing out, but now we know on the news, we've seen that everywhere, we've seen it in sports, we've seen it in people having sudden cardiac death where they fall down, they die or they pass out, yes, you might be able to start some stem, resuscitate them quickly with CPR, which is the most important thing to do in that kind of situation. But for some people, they might pass out and they may not even go into, they might not need CPR then. We've had cases where those people eventually get to, get to, be, to do procedures here in Nigeria, locally, because part of our training also involves us sharing cases. So we have cases that we know where those kind of patients end up coming into the hospital locally and then we do, we do for the walk up and find out that they had life threatening issues that would have been very preventable and very easily treated if they are diagnosed. Um, a number of cases come to mind where locally we find that out, they get a defibrillator, they become completely okay. Or I'll give one story which is very, which really touches me. Um, and I give this story because um, I'm, I'm relatively newer to, I, I joined this group a few years ago. So I haven't been here 10 years. Um, but, um, but, you know, since I've been here, um, you know, we started off in, Nigeria, in the US where, you know, we do the Zoom conferences and we have hundreds of cardiologists on the Zoom platform um, across the world, mostly from Nigeria, where we're discussing the up-to-date standards of care, things that we do in the American College of Cardiology conferences in the, um, you know, our, our interventional conferences. We're discussing what should be done, how you think of a patient, how to manage a patient. And so we've been doing that and we do that um, every year and we have a few sessions um, over a few months of our, um, where we do like eight hour sessions with cardiologists all over brainstorming and all that. One of the things that, one of the benefits of that is that um, local cardiologists present their cases and then they've seen, they show the things that they've done, the changes that they've made over this time frame. Um, so the case I'm going to bring up is a very important one that I learned from. Last year was my, um, you know, a team of, our team came in and there was a patient whose heart rate was 40 for many, for over a year. She basically was in the house not doing anything. And, um, you know, it's what we call complete heart block which means that the upper chamber of the heart and the lower chamber of the heart do not communicate effectively. Mm -hmm. So the lower chamber of the heart is doing its own thing, the upper chamber of the heart is doing its own thing. Normally there should be a communication, there should be a seamless transition mm -hmm. that makes them in synchrony. But that wasn't happening. Now, in the US when that happens, it's quickly detected. We patient gets a, um, a pacemaker quickly and then they're back to, you know, at least yeah. in a few months, and they're back to their life and then they feel up and about. But this lady was basically bed bound, was just within her house, couldn't do anything for over a year, definitely over a year, not much longer, I can't give you the specifics right now. And then until we came and we saw it, and we were like, wow, she complete black heart block for over a year. And then they did the procedure, and then the team did the procedure, the pacemaker was inserted, she feels better, she's back to a great life. So these are things that, you know, we don't know, and the community would not know unless they seek care. We blame it on village people. Well, yes. <laughs> oh, are you? <laughs> Things that happen is not yeah. my portion, you know. Yeah, you know, that kind of that stuff. Thing. So that was, that was really, for me, it was really important because it, it showed that difference of suffering for over a year. And then, and then, of course, you know, you have the heart attacks. You have a chest pain. You come in, you have a heart attack. We have facilities here in Lagos, even over the, in some places in the country also, where you go in immediately and you get revascularized. You don't have to drop dead at home. But you have to know what the symptoms are. You have to know what the signs are. We have to know where to take these patients to. 
and um, get these resources done. Okay, so, uh, while we're talking the, uh, about this, we need to also know the peculiar challenges that you face in Nigeria in trying to do this, whether to educate the people or to um, empower the cardiologists in Nigeria and all that. We're hoping that policymakers are also uh, watching this program to see what needs to be put in place. A lot of people, a lot of doctors, complain that in Nigeria the facilities are not there. So working in Nigeria is a very, very difficult task. And some of them want to just go to where everything is uh, ready. You know, everything is there, they can do that. So what are some of the peculiar um, challenges you find in Nigeria that you think good policy can make better? Um, from, from a policy perspective, I would say that the and the greatest challenge really is healthcare financing. I mean, uh, modern healthcare, especially modern cardiovascular care, is expensive. It's an expensive commodity. Uh, somebody has to pay, and most people are not able to afford the the care. So. So if we are talking about um, pacemakers, we are talking about cardiac surgery, we are talking about uh, stents, we are talking about uh, uh, catheters, so all of these would, uh, the procedures will cost uh, millions of naira. You know, the equipment is expensive, the consumables are expensive. Even if um, the providers are donating, you know, their, their services free of charge, just paying for the consumables and the equipment costs a lot. So in, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the broadest policy challenge, I think that um, the policy makers should really look at developing an effective uh, national health insurance program. Not just what we have now that pays for the minimal uh, preventive care, you know, but, but uh, a health insurance plan that would, uh, you know, pay for the care for people with, who are having heart failure, who are having heart attack, who are having advanced illnesses. And that way the, the people can access the care that they need and that way the younger healthcare providers are not uh, frustrated and uh, disappointed and are not uh, seeking to, to leave the country. Now, from, from our point of view, though, I think one of the things we also do is to focus on prevention, focus on early detection, focus on treatment of risk factors, um, you know, trying to basically uh, get people before they get to the advanced stage of the illness where, where they need uh, a lot more of the uh, expensive, uh, invasive, and interventional uh, procedures. Yeah. And, and to that end, we'll still work with the Nigerian Cardiac Society to um, increase awareness in the, in the community, basically educate members of the public about uh, how to reduce risk factors, how to recognize symptoms, how to seek care early. Um, at the same time, we have to uh, um, build an advocacy arm and reach out to uh, the policy makers, uh, people in government, people in academia, people in private industry, uh, people in the non-profit sector. It will take everybody working together to build a healthcare system that will work uh, for the citizens of the country. Mm. You have something to add? Yeah, I think um, like um, Dr. Marilia said, and he has well put, um, <clears throat> yeah, this is an issue that involves a lot. So, um, you know, we, um, started off here and then, like you said, you know, there's this whole talk of the brain drain. Mm. You know, physicians, um, medical, everybody 
you know, trying to jackpot or get out of the country and then do all that. And so, which obviously doesn't help the system. But what we're trying to do is to transform that brain drain to a brain gain. So the people who are coming here, who are doing these procedures, who are training from abroad and all of that, are mostly people who did part of our training in Nigeria, but mostly Nigerians. The people that are, there are people who have no link to Nigeria at all, who are participating in this and giving talks and actually coming in person also. But mostly people who actually are from here and then trained here. And so over the time, we've done that and then we've, you know, um, tried to make an impact in that perspective. So the goal is trying to like, you know, you bring back and then try to, re to reinforce what we have back here and then try to develop that. Obviously, you need the help of, um, and to partner with the, the government, to partner with, you know, the ministers of health, my matter of whoever is um, in the capacity to develop that. Um, so and maybe even uh, the, the National Orientation Agency, because, yes. you know, information, sensitization and all that, maybe yes. they will handle that. Yes, yes. Right. So that's definitely what we're trying to do. So we're working really well with the Nigerian Cardiac Society. Um, the teaching hospitals across the country are really, really invested in this. We have um, in, in working together in developing what we have because we have the same vision. We want to change um, the healthcare delivery in Nigeria. We want to make things better for our people. I have a master's degree in public health because when I left here, that was my focus, like how do we improve the health of the public, you know, mm -hmm. global health. Um, and so this is part of the idea, like getting people individually, as a community, as a system, all together improving our health. I think a lot needs to be done, like uh, Dr. Merrile said, on working on the people to get to know the signs, the symptoms, yes. how to prevent it and all that. Like I was joking um, earlier on that it's like you need to go back to school and all that. But at this point, let's assess the success story of this program that you're doing. You've been here, maybe not in Nigeria, but you've been around for 10 years. How would you um, evaluate your success? But um, for that, let's be partial. Let's come to Nigeria. How would you evaluate your success, your level of success in Nigeria? I, I think um, the, the word that was used to, to describe the program, at the, the ongoing Nigerian Cardiac Society meeting has been that it's, it's been very impactful. Mm. It's been very impactful. Um, when we first started, um, the, the cardiology trainees in the country, uh, the, the senior registrars, did not really have um, access to training in uh, interventional cardiology, in uh, arrhythmia, electrophysiology, and in advanced imaging. Uh, so. So these are uh, subspecialties within the field of cardiology that, that, that um, the, the training was um, a little um, deficient. So, so what we did was to work with the people here, with the professors in the teaching hospitals and medical schools here to, to develop a curriculum that has um, filled that gap. And, and so since we started, what we have now is that there are several um, Nigerian trained cardiologists who are able to do uh, these procedures uh, in different parts of, of the country. And so we've, we've helped to uh, start an interventional cardiology uh, program at Lasut uh, here in Lagos. We've, uh, we've helped to start one uh, at CardioCare, which is a private hospital in, in Abuja that serves the north. Um, we've also helped to uh, support a program in Port Harcourt and uh, a program in, in Enugu. So, so I think it's really made an impact uh, for uh, a lot of the, the young cardiologists, and we can say that um, a lot of the people who are um, completing their training in Nigeria now are quite uh, conversant with a lot of the procedures that are done all over the world. And we've, 
we've kind of uh, demystified the field uh, for them. Now, a lot of uh, patients also benefit uh, from um, the training program uh, just because uh, we have, um, you know, consumables and devices that are donated so they can get uh, these uh, procedures at a heavily subsidized cost, which otherwise, um, you know, they might not be, be able to afford. So, so while we are focused on education and training, it also ends up being a charitable mission that, that a lot of patients um, benefit from. And then at the same time, we work with the Nigerian Cardiac uh, Society to, to develop uh, public awareness campaigns, education, and uh, advocacy uh, for the field yeah. of cardiovascular health. I, I see the level of success with the professionals has been great because, like you said, impactful. But we need these impactful to also translate to what the ordinary man on the street will, will also see about the kind of information they have about this. So if you were to advise maybe media houses or uh, NGOs and all that, because a lot of people might be interested in making sure that their people are healthy. They just want mm -hmm. to carry out that information uh, to the people. What do you think um, this kind of people, media houses, NGOs, those people involved in advocacy uh, can do to make sure that this message gets to the grassroots more? Okay. Um, great question. Thank you very much. Um, so, addressing uh, media houses and uh, <laughs> addressing you. All stakeholders, yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's, uh, it's important to, to get the message out there. Now, and getting the message out there involves bringing specialists like what you're doing right now mm -hmm. to communicate um, the importance of preventive care, which we don't really have as a culture. Mm -hmm. You know, that idea of, okay, look, I want to get my baseline blood pressure measurement. I want to get and then know that and keep an eye on it. I get a blood pressure cuff and I want to keep that at home. Um, I want to get, know what my blood sugar looks like. I can get blood. I, mean, I could actually wear one of these watches. People carry phones around now that are expensive and then they get um, watches that monitors my heart rate and all of that and then actually gets me so much information about my health. But having a, an avenue where we could communicate from platforms like this to everybody and say, look, um, it's, I know you have stress. I know there are stressors in life. And those stressors increase your risk of high blood pressure, diabetes, having a stroke, shortening your life expectancy, reduces the medium life expectancy in Nigeria to be barely 50, mm -hmm. whereas in other parts of the world it's 80-something. So why is that happening? Why is there a 30-year um, um, difference in life expectancy? There is a role that the community, medical community has to play. There is a role that the government has to play. Has to play. But like you mentioned, media houses, communication um, sectors should communicate this to everybody. So that way when you're in your house and you tune in the TV, and yes, you hear about things happening, but you also want to say, look, no matter what happens in the world right now, in the country right now, what's most important to my kids is that I'm here to take care of them. You know? So that's what happens. That's, why, that's, that's, that's how we need to process it. We need to process it looking like, look, I have these children, I'm stressing out to take care of them, but to do that, I need to take care of me, which means I need to take care of my blood pressure, which means I need to take my medications, which means I need to eat healthy, which means I need to drink more water, which means I need to do all that. And then we pass that out from this kind of platform. So everybody on the streets hears that, and everybody on the street starts thinking about that. And now says, okay, look, I need to periodically, once a year, go to a doctor and then do a checkup. And then not just do it once and wait for, but do it periodically. So you know what exactly you have to work on. And then keep working on that. And then if that becomes our mantra, if that becomes what we do on the street, where we become more health conscious and become more health aware, that eventually affects our community. That affects our useful life. I mean, think about this. Most people go into university and they finish university. And then, you know, in their 20s, okay, okay, and then they're done in their 20s. And then how much time do you have of a useful life if you're going to die in your baby by, by now? 50. You know? So how much useful life is that? What happens to the next generation? They haven't even had enough time to you know, get that support. Grandparents actually help a lot in raising kids. Mm. You know? And then if, they, if they're successful and they still have income coming in because they have a good health, that financially affects the community and then the next generation. 
So yes, we're talking wealth. Like you said, health is wealth. That's the definition of health is wealth, right? We being alive to live longer and then uh, having children and having grandkids and being able to contribute to them because you're healthy and you're not you know, lying in a bed somewhere where you're able to communicate and then help that next generation. So I think that's the philosophical change that we as communicators need to pass across to everybody. Like, let's change the way we think about our health. Mm. When we talk next generation, let me just um, as a final question. Um, what are your hopes for the future? Uh, regarding this program and the kind of intervention you do in, in uh, the various uh, countries that you go to. You must have learned lessons in the course of 10 years. How do you intend to improve on this and make sure uh, you even succeed more? It's more impactful. That, let me use your word. <laughs> so just talk about it with us a little bit before we wrap up. Yes, I, I think the, the, most important person, the most important lesson I've learned is that collaboration is, is going to be is important for success. Um, so, so it will um, improving the health care of our citizens and improving the health care delivery system will require collaboration from the health care collaboration between the healthcare providers, uh, the policy makers, and, and the citizens. Um, we'll continue with education, we'll continue with uh, training, um, we'll, we'll continue with uh, helping to bring in uh, supplies and buying equipment, and we'll all learn from each other. Ultimately, uh, lifestyle changes uh, that the patients make will probably have the greatest impact, you know. Um, just because of our resource limitations, it's still going to be important to develop a heart-healthy lifestyle, uh, avoid cigarette smoking. That's probably the single most important thing that people uh, can do uh, to prevent heart disease. Um, lose weight if you are overweight. Uh, try to exercise uh, regularly. Uh, develop a system for managing stress. It's a very stressful environment. Um, control high blood pressure, control diabetes, control uh, uh, high cholesterol. Um, from our own point of view, we will build uh, stronger relationships with the Nigerian Cardiac Society, with the uh, local medical schools and teaching hospitals, and then um, we'll continue to work in building up the capacity here, but ultimately the, the policy makers have to develop an effective healthcare financing mechanism, uh, because if, if we don't have that and patients are unable to access care and the doctors, the younger doctors are not satisfied, they will continue to emigrate. Mm. Thank God you didn't say stop eating a bar. <laughs> but eat healthy. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I do hope that you were there when, while we were doing this. And we've been talking with Dr. Sheyi Bolorunduro um, and also uh, Dr. Obin Naya um, Thank you so much, gentlemen, for coming on the program this morning. Thank you, thank, you. Thank, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much for it. having us. Yeah, yes. We've enjoyed it. Okay, so tomorrow uh, we shouldn't see somebody just slumming. Uh, and what we know that we have to do is learn more about uh, the signs and symptoms, uh, how to prevent uh, these uh, cardiovascular uh, mishaps that we find every day. It's not everything that you blame on village people. Sometimes you have to take the responsibility yourself. So as we thank the gentlemen and as we try to wrap up, we're going to just uh, drop this quote for you. And you have to see failure as the beginning and the middle, but never entertain it as an end. That is according to Jessica Herring, founder and CEO of Stella and Dot. Uh, well, this is how we wrap it up on the show this morning. Well, let's do it again tomorrow on behalf of the entire team of The Breakfast here on Plus TV. My name is Nyam Gul. Agaji. Have a wonderful day.